Thank you, Dina. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Paul. I am in technical support in our software and bioinformatics group. And today I'm going to be giving you an overview of the version two analysis for our True Set Oncology 500 panel. In terms of what we're going to be covering today, I'm going to start with an overview of the True Set Oncology product family and then give analysis overviews of both the DNA and RNA analysis pipelines. This is going to be a fairly high level overview. We'll go into some detail, but several times you will hear me refer to the software guide for further, more granular details about some of the pipeline elements. After that, uh, we'll talk about the output files, and then at the end, spend a little bit of time talking about our partnership with Tyrion DX for variant reporting, as well as the Illumina Analytical Evaluation Service if you're new to TSO 500, and it's something you're thinking about implementing in your lab. So let's start out with an overview of TrueSight Oncology 500. So TrueSight Oncology 500, or TSO 500, is actually several different products all under the same broad category. There is the original TrueSight Oncology 500, uh, which is for solid tumor samples and was originally released for the NextSeq 500, NextSeq 550, and NextSeq 550DX running in RUO mode, and allows up to eight samples per run, and supports both DNA and RNA. For that, there, the analysis options are running either through a local run manager module. If you have NextSeq control software version 4, you can analyze on instrument, or through a local server uh, that is running the analysis pipeline in a container, either Docker or Singularity. There's also an option to run your secondary analysis through Perian DX in their clinical genomics workspace if you're a customer of theirs as well. Recently released was the TrueSat Oncology 500 high throughput version, which is also for solid tumor samples, but increases compatibility with the Next, uh, NextSeq as well as NovaSeq system to allow higher throughput and higher sample numbers. Uh, while running this panel on the NextSeq, it's still only eight samples. But if you run on the NovaSeq, you can have 16 up to 192 samples. It greatly in increases the number of samples you can run. And this is the high throughput version. For analysis, it is only compatible with the Linux application. There is not a local run manager version of this, and as well as the Perian DX CGW. Now, it's important to note that while you can run the HT libraries on the NextSeq 500, those libraries are not compatible with the local run manager module, so just something to keep in mind. The third product that's currently on the market as well is TrueSight Oncology CTDNA for liquid biopsy samples. This is DNA only. Uh, we're not talking about this version today, but just to give you a little bit of information, this is running on NextSeq uh, sorry, NovaSeq systems only, up to 24 samples per run, and does require a Dragon VC server with the CT DNA analysis software module installed on that. The version 2 analysis pipeline, if running in a, a local Linux server, can handle samples from both the original TSO 500 as well as TSO 500 high throughput and run the exact same analysis pipeline. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. To give a quick overview of the TSO 500, this is a pan-cancer panel that covers 523 genes that are relevant for DNA and RNA variants in multiple ty types of cancer. I have a link down to the data sheet at the bottom, which gives a full list of the genes that are covered in the panel. I just wanted to give this kind of quick overview table to show that multiple types of cancers are covered in this panel, and it is a pan-cancer panel. The panel contains 1.94 megabases of content and allows you to start with either DNA or RNA or both and analyze them both or either one. Uh, for the panel, we have a 5% variant allele frequency limit of detection for small variants. For fusions, you can detect up, uh, down to five copies per nanogram of RNA. And for copy number variations, 2.2 fold changes. And this is at an analytical sensitivity of 96% and an analytical specificity of 9.9998%. So very high specificity at these limits of detection. 
just as a quick comparison of the TSO 500 versus TSO 500 high throughput, as mentioned, the original TSO 500 is NextSeq only, while high throughput is meant for NovaSeq because of the higher plexity, but is compatible with NextSeq systems. There is a slightly different index length for HT, just to make use of the higher number of indexes. Original TSO 500 is only eight samples per run, and HT is up to 192 samples per run on a Nova C. Uh, for analysis, original TSO 500 has Linux local apps version one, which was DNA only, and we presented a webinar on that one last year, as well as versions 2.0 and 2.1, and the local run manager module for local run manager on board the NextSeq, which is version 2.0. For uh, high throughput, that requires version 2.1 of the Linux local app. And that version 2.1 can analyze both library types. So you really only need that one version, depending on which version of the libraries you're using. Uh, there is also a, an evaluation app in BaseSpace that is allowed for limited time use, 30 days only. And this is if you are evaluating the product, we know that setting up a Linux server can uh, have significant costs and time involved. So this is to make sure that the, the panel is something you're comfortable with and gives you results you want. And if you're interested in trying out, please do contact technical support and we can give you more information. Now today we're not covering any of the library preparation aspects of these panels. That was recently discussed in a great webinar by my colleague, Sean, in our library prep group. If you were not able to attend that live, please do check out our recorded webinars for a recording of that. If you're coming from version one of TSO 500 analysis, I wanted to give you a comparison of that version versus version 2.0 and 2.1. So version 2.0 introduces copy number variant calling to the DNA analysis pipeline as well as RNA analysis. If you're using version one of TSO 500, then at that point you had to use the RNA pipeline of TST 170, which is a similar panel also released by Illumina. Uh, in terms of 2.1, it introduces NovaSeq and HT support. And for NovaSeq analyses also allows for multi-node analyses to parallelize some of your analysis and decrease times. We won't be discussing that in detail today, but just to let you know that it is available for that system. Other changes to be aware of is there, there's update to FASTQ generation, update to variant annotation for more accurate annotation and updates to the RefSeq databases. Also improved read alignment and stitching. And this leads to improvement in microsatellite instability accuracy. And an important note here is that some of the samples that you have that may have passed QC metrics in V1 may not pass in V2 just because of the improved accuracy. There's also increased overall fusion detection for sensitivity and specificity. So this can detect more fusions than V1 can in some circumstances, but also some fusions with low supporting reads that were called in V1 may no longer be called in V2. So again, worth noting and worth comparing if you are going from V1 to V2. So with that, we're going to give an overview of the DNA analysis pipeline. One of the important parts of the TSO 500 DNA analysis pipeline is the use of UMIs or unique molecular identifiers. And this is important for allowing us to get to the very low variant allele frequency and high levels of specificity and sensitivity offered in this assay with the amount of content in the panel. So the overview of how this works is we first fragment our DNA. At the fragmentation step, we add UMI adapters and UMIs are unique molecular barcodes that are unique to each sequence or unique to each fragment. What that results in is that reads derived from the same fragment have the same sequence at the ends of each of the inserts. This is important to allow us to enable a high degree of error correction and giving us a distinction between errors and true variants. And this helps us reduce the error rate. So here are two pictures with how alignment works without UMIs and with UMIs. Starting on the left without UMIs, you can see a collection of fragments, most of which have the same base calls in the, these two example positions. So A and C say that these are our same as our reference calls but we do have a couple of fragments where 
there are some differences. So we see one fragment with a G and one fragment with a T. If you're just doing positional alignment, you're going to see some frequency of those other variant calls there, but it's difficult to know with a high degree of accuracy if those are true variants or if they are errors coming from library prep or sequencing. So you can only get down to a certain level of variant detection with a high degree of specificity and sensitivity without UMIs. The benefit of using UMIs over on the right side of this picture is that we're taking our fragment, and in this example, we have a DNA fragment that actually has a real variant denoted by the blue dot. Here we're taking that fragment and we are adding the unique molecular identifiers to each end of the fragment. Any errors introduced from either library prep or sequencing will show up in some of those fragments, but unlikely to be all of them. We first do positional alignment and then collapse all those families together based on the same UMI sequences. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a few slides. But what we do is then we look for a variant that exists in all copies of that fragment. So here we see errors introduced uh, showing by a yellow dot and a green dot. But since those variants don't exist in all fragments, they are filtered out. And only a variant that exists in all copies of that fragment is kept and called as a true variant. So here's a broad overview of the DNA workflow, and I'm going to go through each of the steps. First, let's start out with indel calling and SNV calling. We're first going through our FASTQ generation, and this uses the BCL Convert software, which is a newer BCL conversion software. And this takes a sample sheet and your sequencing run folder as input, performs the demultiplexing, adapter trimming, UMI trimming, and FASTQ generation, and outputs demultiplexed adapter and UMI trimmed FASTQ files with the UMI sequences and the read headers. And those UMI sequences and the read headers is what the UMI collapsing software looks for when we get to that step. We then go through various steps to get the best alignment possible before variant calling. The first step here is alignment of the initial FASTQ files to the genome with BWA. And showing here, we have some variants, some indels, things like that. But we output uh, two initial BAM files. We then go through that read collapsing step. It does rely first on positional alignment to group similar fragments together. And then fragments that are aligned to the same position that have the same UMI sequences are collapsed by a read collapsing software called RICO. This recognizes multiple reads coming from the same starting molecule and collapses them down into a single read. This removes any errors, as we discussed, and leaves only variants that exist in all copies of the molecule and all copies of the read. This is then written back out to FASTQ files. The next step is to, to perform another alignment, this with more accurate and error-corrected files. And this uh, does alignment again with BWA, but again, starting from sort of better quality reads. And Written, those are written out to BAM files as well. The final step is to do indel realignment and read stitching through a software component called Gemini. And this is realignment near indels specifically. And this is to look for the best alignment near indels to remove any alignment artifacts that initially came from BWA. After that realignment, we then stitch the reads together. So any reads that overlap are stitched together. And that is to get the best quality base calls from those overlapping. After we've gone through the uh, read stitching, realignment, quality correction, and so on, we do an initial variant calling from our variant caller Pisces. And Pisces is an Illumina variant caller used in various pipelines of ours. And that outputs a standard VCF file, an example shown here, where you have chromosome position, variant call, various informations about the call, and so on. But that's not the final step. Uh, in order to get the best possible quality variant calls, we then do post-processing through a software component called PEPA2. And this takes the small variant GVCF files generated by the, by the Pisces variant caller and does dynamically adjusting uh, post-processing it's based on background noise, nucleotide change, and read type support. And a lot of this is based on models developed from 
background baseline noises using normal FFPE samples. So PEPE2 will calculate three scores when it's looking at each base that it scans for. The first score that it creates is the variant quality or AQ score. And this is a p-value calculated to measure the significance of the variant frequency. And that's based on the variant depth, the total depth, and known background noise at that location. Next is the likelihood ratio score, or LQ. And that is also a p-value. And that's the measure of the likelihood that the variant calls an error, given the estimated error rate of the observed total and variant supporting read. Finally, it can it computes a bias score, and this is to help lower false positives. Uh, false positives often arise from overrepresented variant supporting reads in some read types. So this takes this, this into account and, pro and produces a possible bias score. These scores are then calculated to determine if the variant is a true variant or not. And there are various thresholds for these scores depending on the variant type. And there are more there's more information about what those thresholds are for different types of variants listed in the guide. So I would recommend checking that if you would like more information on that, on those scores and how they're used. The next step is complex variant calling specifically for EGFR exon 19. And this particular exon is a biomarker for various types of lung cancers. And it's known to be passed down or uh, seen as complex variants, and we have to sort of stitch them together or phase them together to know which variants we're looking at. And the specific variants we're looking for as complex variants are listed in the guide. But this is looked for by a software piece called Scylla. And what this does is it detects longer multinucleotide variants than the Pisces small variant caller is able to detect. Uh, Pisces will detect small nucleotide variants, uh, small multinucleotide variants, about three bases, and small indels. And then Scylla is able to determine whether these variants should be phased together into longer multinucleotide variants for more accurate variant annotation. So the way this works is we're starting off with the GVCF file and looking into these the specific exon for EGFR. The software sorts candidates into local neighborhoods of linked to variants, and then looks at the BAM file to make sure that these variants are actually in phase with each other or essentially grouped together. And based on those findings, they will then be written to this EGFR complex variants VCF file. The final stage of this is that the Pisces and PEPA2 filtered variants are put into the filtered small variants GVCF file. The EGFR complex variants have their VCF file, and then those are merged together into the merged variants GVCF file that is part of the output. As I mentioned before, the limit of detection for the assay is 5%, and that's at those very high levels of sensitivity and specificity. But with the use of the UMIs and the error correction and the variant filtering, it is possible to actually detect variants below 5%. So that 5% is not a hard cutoff. Because of the PEPA2 filtering, we can actually call variants at a lower frequency depending on the quality of the sample and the background noise of that particular sample. So this is just this chart here to show that various mutations are detectable at lower limits. This is going to be with lower sensitivity and specificity, but it is possible to even detect mutations down to 1%. So if you are taking a look at your combined variant output file or your VCF, and you see variants called at lower than 5%, it's because, again, that is not a hard cutoff. It is actually a dynamic cutoff based on the quality of the call. Next part of the pipeline we're going to be talking about is copy number variant calling, or CNVs. And this is new as of version 2 of the pipeline. It was not present in version 1 of the pipeline. CNV analysis is done through a, a software called Craft, and we go through several steps in order to get good CNV calls. So FFPE samples tend to be fairly noisy, just based on things like DNA degradation, PCR duplicates, the inf or enrichment efficiency. And you can also have factors such as larger target sizes, changes to read depth, GC bias, and so on. So what Craft does first 
is to use a baseline normalization technique uh, where we start with a baseline that's uh, based on known FFPE samples, normal samples, so we know what they should look like. And this gives us a normalized baseline uh, that cleans up the, the counts, as you see at the sort of after version there, and allows us to more easily pick out actual changes to gene numbers. After we go through that normalization and baseline correction step, we then calculate fold change results. So for each gene, a fold change is calculated from the normalized and baseline corrected read count. The normalization step divides each gene into multiple bins, and you'll see those bins and bin names over on the left-hand part of the normalized bin count file there. And these bins are a varying length that depend on the gene length. The number of normalized reads in each bin is reported into that intermediate file named normalized bin count. Those normalized bin counts are then used to calculate a fold change value for each gene shown on the right. Fold change here is defined as the median normalized bin count value for a target gene divided by the median bin count value of the entire panel. So basically for each target gene, we're comparing the genes counts to counts across the entire panel to look for change from that baseline. The fold change values are then reported in that fold change.txt intermediate file. And then those fold change values are also copied to a VCF file that I'll show you in the next slide. You'll see the other column here, which is a Q score. And that Q score is a FRED transformed value based on the P value. The Q score indicates the confidence of that score. So a higher Q score means a higher confidence uh, in that actual fold change value. This is then finally output into a CNV VCF file. Uh, and an example is shown here where we have the chromosome and position uh, reference and then uh, possible values where a dot is, indicates no deletion or duplication is identified. The fold change value is shown in this VCF file. And the info also shows you the gene that's being uh, assessed here. This fold change value is gene level, so that's where it goes down to. Uh, but in this output file, we have the, the VCF, and it will list the results for all the, of the 59 genes that are in this panel that are being assessed for VCF. Uh, important to note here uh, is that there are possible alt values of no deletion or duplication identified, uh, identified deletion being a lower fold change value, or a duplication being an increased fold change value. However, in this version of the assay, Deletion calls will always have a low confidence filter. Duplication calls will have a pass filter. And this is just based on the validation of this assay with the control samples used. Uh, none of them had deletions in them. So these, this is really a verified amplification assay in this point. It is possible to call these deletions, but these are in silico predictions. So if you're looking for deletions or lower fold change, be aware they will always be filtered as low confidence, and we do recommend confirming those or validating those with orthogonal methods. The next part of the assay we're going to talk about is MSI, or microsatellite instability. So a little bit of background first. Microsatellites are small regions, tens to hundreds of bases long of repeating motifs. And these motifs can be anywhere from one to nine nucleotides. In this example here on this side, I'm showing an example of a dinucleotide motif, so repeats of CA. As I'll talk about in a moment, the TSO500 assay actually asks this as homopolymers, so stretches of the same base. Microsatellites are very common in the genome, and they are difficult to copy correctly just because of things like polymerase slippage. Uh, but they are normally maintained by the mismatch repair pathway. So if there's insertions or deletions during microsatellite motifs during DNA replication, they're normally fixed by the mismatch repair proteins, and those are sort of shown as a network on the left side here. Uh, if there's problems in the mismatch repair pathway, then there will be a failure to correct errors. So these microsatellite alleles can have an increased or decreased number of repeats in that microsatellite if there's problems with the mismatch repair proteins. 
and showing an example here of what a traditional assay for microsatellite instability looks like is normally done through PCR methods. And just due to PCR and, and the limitations of that with things like polymerase slippage and so on, you would normally expect to see this range of peaks kind of grouped around the, the average microsatellite size, in this case as, as 120. If there's problems with the mismatch repair proteins, then you will see that the peaks begin to drift away from that normal size. In this case, we're seeing loss of the microsatellite repeats down to smaller size. And the reason this is important for therapies is that there is an FDA-approved immunotherapy treatment for microsatellite instability based on defects in the mismatch repair pathways. So it's important to know what the microsatellite instability score is uh, in order to know if this is a possible therapy that can be used to treat certain types of cancers. Now, as mentioned, MSI is normally detected through PCR methods. The limitation of that is that most PCR methods can only assay about five to seven sites. Uh, with TrueSite Oncology, we actually have, a TrueSite Oncology 500, we actually have 130 sites that we assess within the genome. So a very high number of sites that are possible for us to look at. This table here just shows a very high concordance with traditional MSI PCR methods, uh, showing that what MSI PCR is calling a stable versus high, we are also calling that with our MSI score. But how is the MSI score calculated? Well, we're taking those BAM files that have gone through all the read collapsing, realignment, and stitching, so getting our high quality alignments here. And then the MSI status is determined by software called Hubble. And the TSO 500 panel, as mentioned, has these 130 homopolymer sites. These are all in non-coding regions. They're un ethnicity unbiased, so no population variability. And each locus has a normal range of repeat frequency. So a normal range of what we expect those repeats to be when mismatch repair is functioning properly. We call something as being unstable when it's outside of that normal range of while we have 130 sites that we look at, we don't need all of them. We only need 40 accessible sites to calculate that score. And each one of those accessible sites needs to have a minimum of 60 full spanning. So the way this score is calculated then is to take the number of unstable sites, so sites that fall outside of the expected normal range, divided by the total number of assessed sites. And this will give us an MSI score. And based on internal training and validation sets, and also in agreement with traditional MSI PCR, we call greater than 20% uh, of MSI instability as MSI high, or less than 20% as MS stable. And in your combined variant reports, you'll see an MSI entry, where you'll see the total number of sites that were accessible, in this case, 102 out of the 130, and the total number of sites that were called as unstable, and then the percent unstable site. So in this example, we would say that this particular sample was MSI high. The final part of the DNA analysis workflow we're going to talk about is tumor mutational burden, or TMB. TMB is also an important biomarker related to immunotherapy outcome. So not every tumor responds well to immunotherapy, and immunotherapy being uh, drugs or treatments that specifically target cancer cells as opposed to sort of more broad spectrum treatments like chemotherapies or radiation treatments. But this does rely on being able to tell tumor cells apart from normal cells. And tumor mutational burden is an important marker for this because tumor cells that have high tumor mutational burden scores uh, may have high neoantigen loads. And neoantigens are cell surface receptors that are unique to tumor cells that are not present on normal cells. And if we have evidence that the tumor cells have a high level of neoantigens, that can predict increased immunotherapy response or better response to targeted therapies. Traditionally, you would calculate uh, TMB scoring through tumor normal comparisons or whole exome scoring as well. Uh, TSO 500 is a tumor only panel, but we have compared this to tumor normal comparisons. 
And we tested this and trained this on 170 different FFPE samples from a variety of tissue types. And we were able to find a high degree of correlation between traditional tumor normal scoring and the TSO500 tumor only scoring. And the key part of that has to do with the variant filtering and the germline filtering that we'll talk about over the next couple of slides. So the TMB score that we're looking at is generated by software called TMB Rater, or sometimes called Tomb Rater. Uh, what this is taking as input is the small variant GVCF file that has been annotated by our annotation engine Nirvana. And we're looking at the number of synonymous and non-synonymous somatic mutations carried in those tumor cells. So what the TMB Rater software does is it takes those annotated variants, removes germline variants, determines eligible variants, and we'll talk about what an eligible variant is in the next slide, and then calculates the, the TMB score based on the number of eligible variants. And then that score is written to the combined variant output file. So that TMB score is total eligible variants over the total coding region that meets coverage requirements, in this case, FISBX. So what is an eligible variant? So we've mentioned that a couple of times. So eligible variants are small nucleotide variants and indels. Uh, we do not look at multinucleotide variants in this case. And they have to be pass variants, so they pass all of our quality filters. They have to be in coding regions. They have to have sufficient coverage, in this case, greater than or equal to 50x, as well as meet the 5% variant allele frequency cutoff. In this case, we are looking at both non-synonymous and synonymous somatic mutations. Non-eligible variants are those that are in non-coding regions or in low confidence regions, which we know to be low confidence just based on our, our testing of background noise in different regions. We're also filtering out variants with high cosmic counts as these are generally hotspot mutations and are in cancer driver genes and usually not tied to specific neoantigen formation and including them tends to inflate the TMB scores. We're also removing germline variants because we are specifically looking for somatic variants carried by tumor cells. So we filter these based on those annotated variants that are in the databases, and that's where the annotation from Nirvana comes in. We also do an additional filtering step. We're looking for variants based on the variant allele frequency that are closer to somatic variants and, and not germline variants. The combined variant output score then gives us our total TMB score, and we'll also report out on the coding region size that was used and the number of passing eligible variants. Now, unlike MSI, uh, there is not a cutoff for what is considered a high TMB score because that can vary by tissue type and tumor type. So we give the score, but it's important to know exactly what sort of tissue and tumor you're looking at to know if that is a significant score or not. So that's the DNA of analysis pipeline, and we'll now talk about the RNA analysis pipeline in TSO500. The RNA workflow here will call fusions and splice variants. We go through a couple of steps before we get to that, starting from our fast queues, and it's important to note that these RNA libraries do not contain UMIs. Those are specific to the DNA libraries. We're generating the RNA fast queues. We're going to be doing alignment with STAR, but in order to make these reads more compatible with the STAR aligner, we first have to downsample and trim them to an optimal read length. And this is for best performance with the STAR aligner. And if you're more interested in why these uh, read lengths and, and read numbers were chosen, this is another time I'm going to recommend checking the software guide as it gives a good graph of read length and efficiency with the STAR aligner. We use the STAR liner, which is an open source software that's used frequently in RNA-seq because it is a splice-aware aligner, that it is able to align reads ac across splice junctions, aligning specifically to the exons. These aligned reads are then written to BAM files, and also the splice junctions are identified from this initial alignment and then written to a text file that is used a little bit later in the pipeline. Next, we do duplicate read removal. Now, as I just mentioned, we don't have UMIs in these, so this is duplicate read removal based specifically on positional alignment. So these are read pairs with identical start and stop coordinates, and those are considered to be duplicates. 
The output from, them, from that is then deduplicated BAM files. In order to do the splice variant calling, we have a software called Splice Girl, which takes the uh, splice junctions identified in the initial alignment and then looks at the deduplicated BAM files for evidence of if they are usable splice variant calls. So the way this works is, again, with a few filtering steps first. We take those initial splice junctions identified by the aligner. We filter out junctions already annotated by gen code because we are looking for oncogenic splice events rather than G, uh, general de novo events or known splice events from our, our no normal non-tumor samples. Uh, so we filter out those junctions present in the normal baseline from non-tumor samples. And then from what's left, we generate a score that's based on each junction. And this is based specifically on counting the unique number of split reads across that junction as support. We then score each junction based on the number of supporting read counts and output that to a splice variant VCF file. So here's what that splice variant VCF file looks like. Uh, we have the position and we have if there is a deletion in this case in the, the splice variant calling. And there's two filter possibilities. Uh, one is low Q for not passing the, the quality score. And this quality score is calculated specifically on the number of reads that uh, span that splice junction. Uh, so we are looking for number of unique variant reads. Remember, these have been deduplicated. And then we divide that by 10. So we need at least 10 unique variant reads to, sp to span that splice variant junction. Uh, if we have 10 reads, that gets divided by 10 and gives a score of one. If you have more, that score is still capped at, at, at one just for ease of the variant calling. Anything lower than 10 is going to be less than one. So if you see the low Q filter, that means that we did not have at least 10 unique supporting reads for that splice variant. But if you see pass, that means that that variant score uh, had enough supporting reads to call the splice variant. The last part of the RNA workflow is fusion calling. So here we are taking reads that have been flagged as abnormal or chimeric in the BAM files. And, and these are reads that have multiple alignments in multiple genes. We take these and we assemble them into fusion contigs. And these fusion contigs need to have at least three unique supporting reads to become fusion candidates. These fusion candidates are then filtered and scored by our RNA fusion filter. This actually goes through a lot of filtering steps so we don't have time to get into today. But again, there are more details in the software guide. The output from this is an allfusions.csv file. And this all fusions file will list the fusions that are coming from Manta and then filtered by the RNA fusion filter. But if you see over on the left hand side, uh, the caller, you'll see many of these are RNA fusion filters. Those are ones coming from Manta as the fusion caller. But you will also see Splice Girl entered there. That's because Splice Girl is designed for intragenic gene splicing events, but can also detect splice events from larger ranges, so between genes. But that would be a gene fusion. Uh, so it's able to call that as a fusion or write them to the fusion file. And this fusion file will then have all fusions from intergenic splice events identified by either one of those software components. And then the filter status for those potential fusions. Uh, you'll see here the ones that are marked as true have enough supporting reads for the fusions and score, score high enough to be kept as a true fusion. We will also call fusion directionality if it's possible. And that's shown here with the first gene is the left side of the fusion, gene A of the five prime fusion partner. And then gene B is the right side of the fusion or the three prime fusion partner. So that's the overview of the different analysis components. Let's talk about now the output files you're going to get from this analysis. So depending on if you're doing DNA analysis or RNA analysis or both, you'll get different files. For the DNA analysis, you'll get those small and complex variants GVCF files. You'll get the annotated uh, variant calls in the form of a JSON file. You get your copy number VCF file. 
you also get a TMB trace file. And this is the source of the TMB score that goes into the combined variant report. But also that TMB trace file gives you more information about each of the uh, variants that were used in the TMB analysis. So for example, if you wanted to see if a particular variant was filtered out for being a hotspot variant, or if you want to see if it's a synonymous or non-synonymous variant, you can find that in the TMB trace file. And then you'll get the combined DNA variant report for those DNA samples. Uh, if you're running RNA analysis, you'll get the, that Fusion's CSV file, you get the splice variants VCF file, and then you'll get the Fusion and intergenic splice variant VCF file that has those calls from Manta and Splice Girl combined together. And then you'll get the combined RNA variant output file as well. If you're running both DNA and RNA together, you'll get a combined variant report that merges all of those different reports together, as well as the different DNA and RNA results. You'll also get a metrics report that has various metrics about the run and about the analysis and coverage and so on. We're not covering that today. That was covered in depth by my colleague, Sean, in her recent library preparation webinar. So again, if you didn't attend that and would like more information on that metric support, please do check out the recording of that webinar. Just to know where to actually find your files, you'll see an analysis folder within the run folder or wherever you've set your output file to be, and that will contain your results. Within your results, you'll have the metric output file, and if you ran this as DNA only or RNA only, you'll see the DNA results or the RNA results. If you ran this as a paired analysis, then you'll then have a pair folder that contains your combined variant output file, as well as your individual DNA and RNA results. So just to summarize again what you're going to see in each of these reports, and this is the combined variant output file that you see at the end. The MSI and TMB scores are coming from the DNA analysis and will be in a DNA or paired report. Small and complex variants also in DNA or paired. CNVs also in DNA or paired. The other two variant types are from RNA analysis, the splice variants and fusion. So you'll see that in an RNA report or in a paired report. So just as a quick example of what some of these look like, in this case, this is a DNA only sample. So we see the analysis details, the sequencing run details, those are common to both variant types. But we also see our TMB score, our MSI score, and our small variant reports at the bottom. In this case, we didn't do RNA analysis. So all the amplifications, splice variants, fusions, uh, sorry, amplifications would be covered here as CMB, but splice variants and, and fusions are not reported. For an RNA-only sample, we would then have splice variants and fusions reported, but nothing else reported for the other variant types. For a paired sample, our combined variant output would then contain all the results from both DNA and RNA in one report. So that's how the pipeline works and what you get out of the pipeline. But of course, just having a variant call doesn't necessarily tell you what you should do about that. That's where variant reporting, filtering, and understanding what the significance of that particular variant come in. And in order to provide high quality variant reporting, we have partnered with Kirin DX for use with their clinical genomics workspace. And they are our preferred partner for genomic reporting. And you can also uh, purchase licenses for Perian DX CGW along with the TSO 500 kit. So the reason we partnered with Perian DX for using CGW is they have a very large and highly curated knowledge base. And this is curated assertions coming from FDA approved guidelines, as well as shared medical content along with public data sources. And this gives them very up-to-date, very high-quality filtering and reporting. An example of what you might get from a report here, and again, this is an example. If you were to use CGW, your, your final report may look different, is this automated and customizable genomic report. So here we have an example variant, and we get variant classification systems. Uh, we see that this particular one is considered TMB high, but MSI stable also links out to any clinical trials that are currently ongoing that relate to this particular tumor type in this particular variant, as well as information about that variant, what the significance of it is, what it affects, and so on. 
finally want to end with a mention of the TrueSight Oncology Analytical Evaluation Service. And this is a service offered through Illumina. Uh, we know that taking on a new assay can be a lot of work. Uh, there's a valuation time to develop all your project planning, develop your SOPs, basically getting everything up and running. Uh, what we have through the analytical evaluation service is a way to get you up and running with this assay in much less time. It can reduce the evaluation time from six to nine months to about 10 weeks. And this offers things like planned experimental designs, workbooks, checklists, SOPs, truth tables, and so on. Uh, and if this is something that you are interested in learning more about, uh, then we do have a contact address here down at the bottom, which is tso500aes at illumina.com. Just send an inquiry to that email, and then that service will get back to you with more information to see if this is something that you're interested in. Finally, wanted to provide links to further resources. So in this case, both TSO500, the original version, as well as TSO500 high throughput, as they are both analyzed in the same pipeline and the same method. And then links to the Linux local, local app user guide, as well as the local run manager module guide for the next seek.